Hello, this is Pastor Brad. We want to thank you for joining with us today. You have faithfully watched and, and worshiped with us through the months. I know COVID has turned everything upside down. Many of you have not been able to be here with us at all. Some of you have been able to come out sometimes to join with us. But uh, I just want you to know, we love you and we miss you. Together as a church family, we want to kind of include you in today a little bit. We've had some that were able to come early. We're going to have them say hello. We're going to have some music just a little bit to share with you. We're in the book of Revelation. We've been walking through the book of Revelation. You know that. Today we're going to look at the Christmas narrative, the story of Christ, from the book of Revelation. We're stepping out of the flow of the series, and we're going to come back. But I want to encourage you, invite you to join with us. I think it'll be a real encouragement to you. Um, and so today, we're just reminded that Christmas is about the birth of Christ and ultimately what it accomplishes, the victory that is coming. Revelation is all about that victory that is ours, that is coming because Jesus Christ came. We are reminded that uh, the Lord spoke to Joseph. He gave him a promise. He gave humanity a promise. He's told Joseph, he says, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. He says, that which is conceived from her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. The Christmas story is not just about the manger. It's about the cross. It's about the resurrection. It's about Jesus Christ now ascended into glory and one day coming back. It will be fulfilled and completed when Jesus Christ returns. We are studying that now and finding encouragement in that. If you're home, I just want you to take courage. The Lord is with you. He's walking with you. Let him speak into your soul and just bring the refreshing word of God to you. Ask God to use you to make a difference with your life somehow to someone, sharing the good news of the gospel. And let us together just, just claim that mantle, that opportunity we have to share Jesus Christ. We want to wish you a Merry Christmas, a wonderful holiday, um, and worship the Lord. Be encouraged. Thank you for joining with us today. Christmas. you a Merry Christmas. This week we get to be with family either together or on Zoom or FaceTime or whatever. Uh, situations probably be a lot different. It's, it's a chance to celebrate Christ. It's a chance to give gifts to one another, uh, to love one another. Pray that uh, this Christmas will be meaningful for you, special to you, uh, a reminder to you of Christ and what he's done for you. Uh, we've been together now for a while. We are in the book of Revelation. It's a joy to be walking through this book together. There's a lot to cover. And I'm doing a first today. We're going to look at a Christmas narrative from the book of Revelation. We're stepping out of the flow of where we've been. We've been in chapter 2 and 3, looking at the churches that Jesus is writing to. Today we're going to still be in Revelation, but we're going we're to uh, look at another account. We're going to jump ahead. 
And what we're going to see here is we're going to see a, a Christmas narrative come alive here in the book of Revelation. Appropriate to this time of year as we celebrate uh, the birth of Jesus Christ. And uh, fitting, fitting to the whole picture, especially as it fits here in Revelation and where we're going and what the Lord's communicating to us. So my prayer is that it'll, it'll really just touch your heart, that the Spirit of God will use it, and just remind us of some very essential things here that are important to know and to understand and to see as we think about the birth of Christ, what it means for us, and uh, so I'm looking forward to that. What we see here ultimately is the gift of hope, the gift of hope in Christ. But what we see here, it's in a different context here in the book of Revelation. It, it's, the, it's, the, it's the message of hope, but it's in this huge, overarching, big picture context of conflict. And so Revelation gives us a glimpse back to the birth of Christ that, uh, that shows us the reality of this. And so I want to look at this this morning. From the very beginning of scriptures, when the scriptures were written, when Adam and Eve first fell into sin, we see the battle begin, and it's continued ever since. Genesis 3, I'm, I'm going to put hostility, I'm going to put conflict, I'm going to, I'm going to put trouble, turmoil, warfare between you and the woman, between the serpent and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He, that's referring to Christ, that's singular, he shall bruise your head, the serpent, and you shall bruise his heel. Jesus Christ is going to have ultimate victory over Satan at the cross. He's going to bruise his head. Satan is going to bruise his heel. That's what the cross is. It's a bruising of his heel. It's a, it's a picture. It's fatal, but it's not fatal. Uh, he gives up his life willingly, but he takes it back up again. And what we see here is the very beginning consequence of sin. We see the very beginning uh, provision of God for the price of sin, the consequence of sin. We see the victory of Jesus Christ right here. This is the very first prophecy that is given to us that shows us ultimately what unfolds in all the scriptures. And so this is very relevant to everything that we're seeing and unfolding here. I want us to remember, as we think about uh, Christmas and gifts, James has a, has a reminder to us, chapter 1, verse 17. Everything, everything in our life, everything good that we have in our life, it comes from God. It's from His hand. Uh, and no matter what it is, if it's good in our life, then God has enabled it. God has allowed it. Um, in God's power, He has given to it to us. In His blessing, He has given it to us. Everything good is from the hands of God. We work hard and we, and with, the, with the work of our own effort, and we gain and we accumulate and we give and we do all these things, but God gives us the ability, the intellect, uh, the time. He gives it all to us. It is from His hand. And so it's a reminder to us, very essentially important, that if there's anything good in my life and in yours this morning, you need to know that ultimately it's come from God. As we look at, uh, at the passage we're going to be in this morning, what I want us to see is this. We see ultimately the perfect gift. It's, it's in Christ. It's in His Son, Jesus Christ. I want us to see different facets of that gift. What is it that the Lord gave to us? What are the expressions of His gift into our life? So we're going to go to Revelation chapter 12, and we're going to see this. We're going to step into a context that we're going to, we're going to look at later. We're going to exegete it later. But I'm just going to, I want to, want to touch base on it this morning and, and draw principles from it that are relevant to us this morning as we consider the birth of Christ. Revelation chapter 12. We're going to look at different parts of it, not all of it together. What we see here is, is promise, promise from God in the midst of spiritual warfare. It is filled with promise, and yet it is filled with war, it is filled with conflict, uh, it is filled with spiritual battle, and uh, it is all a part of the narrative of Christmas. What we see are, are gifts that are expressed in this passage that God has given to us as we think about the, the narrative of Christmas and, and the incarnation of Jesus Christ, His coming to earth. What is it when He came? What is it that He gave to us? What is the significance of His birth to us? Let's look at it this morning. The first thing that we see is the gift of His love. We know for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. We know that, that love is the greatest expression of God's heart. That first gift we see here in chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to, to read along, and I'm going to have it on the screen as well. And we're going to look at various verses here in this passage, and we're going to pull them together and draw from them a picture, a complete picture, of what happened at the birth of Christ. Verses 1 and 2, we read these words. A great sign, 
appeared in heaven. So a sign, a sign is given, it's a symbol, but it's, it's intended to point to a specific literal truth. It's intended to reveal something that God wants us to know. And so it's, it's to convey that truth. And scripture in its, in its totality reveals the meaning behind that sign. A great sign appeared in heaven. Here's the sign. A woman clothed with the sun, with a moon under her feet, and on her head was a crown of 12 stars. Well, if we were to do, dig deeper and do exegesis here, we would see that this woman ultimately is, is identified, is associated with, is representative of the nation of Israel. Um, and so all these symbols come together, the 12 stars, the 12, the, uh, 12 tribes of Israel, etc. But what we see here is this woman. Um, we see as she represents Israel, we see inherent in this is the love of God. So what's being expressed at the very beginning here, without exegesing the rest of the passage and, and all that's in, a part of what's going on here, is this reality. This lady who is symbolized here is a symbol of Israel. God is bringing Israel together, and something is happening within the nation of Israel at this time, and there's warfare associated with it. We're going to see that. But I want us to see uh, the importance of this here. God reminds us in Deuteronomy, he says about Israel, about the Hebrews, you are a people, you are holy to the Lord your God. The Lord God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and he chose you. For you the, you are the fewest of all peoples. God ultimately drew, drew Israel to himself. God chose Israel for one reason. Because he loved them. Not because of who they were. Not because of anything inherent in their qualities. Not because of anything that was, that was attractive about them. He simply chose to love them. The gift of his love on a, on a specific nation. He made them a nation. Among many nations in the, in the world. He chose this one. In Jeremiah 31 we see this tie with the passage in Revelation. A covenant. God says, a covenant I made with your fathers on the day when I brought them out of Egypt, my covenant they broke. Though I was their husband, declares the Lord. And so he, he gives this, this picture, not the only place in Scripture in the Old Testament, where he shows us this relationship that Israel has with him. He is the husband, she is the bride. This woman in Revelation 12 is, is ultimately, though, is represented as the, as the wife of 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 God, this relationship of a marital oneness, when we see that ultimately in the scriptures, uh, in the Old Testament, no, numerous times. And uh, it says here, they're in a covenant relationship. They would break that covenant relationship over and over, this, this sin of adultery against God. They were committed to a covenant of fidelity to him, of oneness to him in that, in that relationship. And Israel broke that over and over again. And yet he continued, he continued and he continues to love them. This woman shows the reality that Israel is a people chosen by God. Not only that, if you're listening this morning and you know Jesus Christ, we also are chosen by God. We are loved by God. You, you are a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you and I may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He loves us. He chose us to be in relationship with Him. Not because there's anything inherently good in us. There's nothing good in us. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But He chose us because He loves us out of love. 1 John shows us this. See what great love the Father has lavished has lavished on you. When He saved you, He was he poured out, he was pouring his love into your life. That is the motivation why that relationship took place in the first place. And so because of that, we are called the children of God. We're called the children of God. And so we see that reality. We see, we see the love of Jesus Christ, the, the greatest gift. Jesus Christ came to this earth because he loved us. God so loved the world. Here we see that unique relationship in, in in Revelation 12, the woman is, as we tie it to the Old Testament, is none other than Israel herself. She is still pictured here in Revelation. She's not taken off of the table and no longer a part of the picture. She's very much a part of the picture. 
And this is during the tribulation that we see. But not only that, you and I are a chosen people. We are loved. And John 3.16 makes it clear that God's love is still being poured out every day. The gift of His love is the message of Christmas. We see that here. We see also the gift of His truth come out of this passage. You know, God, because He loves us, because He loves us so much, because He loves you so much, He speaks truth into your life. He wants you to know the reality of life, of your situation, of your need, of, of our weakness. He speaks truth into our lives so that we can know that truth and we can respond and follow Him accordingly. We see in verse 12, verse 3 of the same passage in Revelation. And another sign, so we have another sign, second sign, appeared in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. And so we see here ultimately... Uh, we see this red dragon, uh, very powerful kingdoms here being being uh, communicated. Uh, authority, the diadems, crowns is what they are. And so we see a, a dragon, a great red dragon. And, and we, as we continue, um, what we see here is the reality of an adversary, an adversary to the woman, a powerful adversary comes into play. Verse 9 shows us this. And there was a great dragon that is the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan. That, that same dragon we call Satan, we call the devil, that was there in the garden who, who took uh, possession of that serpent and spoke to Adam and Eve and tempted her. He has, he has been our adversary from the very beginning. And he is the one who is here. He is the one who is, who is the pinnacle of evil. And so he is here before the woman he is here to, uh, uh, to oppose her. He is here to fight her. He is here to, to bring her down. In fact, we see, we see in verse 4, his tail, symbolism, right? His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And so what we see pictured here, we see it in Isaiah, we see it in Ezekiel. We're not going to turn to those passages. We see a description of, of ultimately the fall of Satan when he was in heaven in glory with the Lord before all things had, had been comp uh, completed in creation and he, and, he, and he rebelled against God and he took up the third of the angels with him and they were thrown out of heaven. They were cast down out of heaven. They still have access to heaven, but they were thrown out of, of dominion in heaven and, and, and privilege in heaven. And uh, warfare began, and that warfare ultimately came down to earth, and Satan came into that garden, and he tempted Adam and Eve and sought to take the dominion of man away from God. That's why Jesus came to earth, to, 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 to right the wrongs and, and to bring the deed of ownership of this earth back into his, his hands through his work on the cross. Ephesians 6, 12 reminds us that we don't wrestle against uh, flesh and blood and, and, and things that we see and are tangible. We wrestle against spiritual forces. Whatever, whenever we run into sin in our life, whenever we run into adversity and difficulties and evil people and evil things, it is, there is sin behind that. There is an evil force behind that. Um, and that's the reality. No, no matter what challenges and troubles we face, there is, there is the evil behind that. There's a force behind that that is worldwide, and we need to be reminded of that. So Jesus tells us the truth. That is his great gift to us. Verse 9, we see this, the great de uh, dragon is a deceiver. He is a deceiver of the whole world. We need to know, when we receive Jesus Christ as Savior, we, we confess and we are aware of, and we lay before the Lord our sin. We recognize that we are a sinner, we're in bondage, and, and our very nature is sinful. And it helps us to understand and know that as we walk forward in faith from that moment forward, we still are in a spiritual battle. We need to know, you need to know that there's an adversary out there who wants to destroy you. There is this adversary, Satan, he is a deceiver. He never tells the truth. And he is out to deceive the whole world, the whole world, everyone who lives in this world. His, his modus operandi is deception. He never tells the truth. John 8, 44 tells us the devil, he is a murderer. In other words, he sucks the life out of people. He holds us in, in the bondage of death and sin. There is no truth in him. He is the father of lies. Uh, it is his character. He is a liar. He is the father of lies. He cannot speak the truth. He always 
takes the truth and he and he and he misinterprets it and he misuses it and he always uses it to deceive us. His character is deceit. And you and I must be on guard constantly. And so God gifts us by telling us this, reminding us that we're in a spiritual warfare. It's good to know that. It's good to be aware of that. It's good to be on guard. That's why he tells us. So that we can fight that battle. We can fight it in his strength with him. Satan, uh, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, disguises himself. He can't, he can't, he will not reveal to you his true nature. He will not reveal to you the dangers and the consequences of bad choices that, that we are tempted to make. He's not going to lay that in front of you and say, well, if you, if you do this, this is going to be the consequence. Of course not. He only lays out what appear to be the, 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 the positives that will come out of following, and following through in that temptation. He never shows the consequence. God says there's always a consequence to following our sinful desires. There's always a consequence to doing the wrong thing, not doing the will of God. There is always a consequence. We live, we live in a culture, we see politicians hide who they really are, not convey the truth, keep the truth hidden and blocked and, 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 and never exposed and, and never communicated, so we never know who they truly are until they're elected. We see people putting on masks. We live, to, we put on masks in front of us so people don't see who we really are. Deception is the name of the game. And uh, in Jesus Christ, we are to live differently. We are to have a different understanding. We are to know that our enemy is deceptive all the time. Chapter 12, verse 4, we see this. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth. Oh, we have this woman. Oh, she's going to give birth. We're going to see that in a second. And she bore a child, and he might devour it. See, here's, here's the thing about Satan. Not only is he deceptive, he's a threat. He's a daily threat. His goal was to destroy that infant who was to be born. His goal is to destroy anything good that God is trying to do in your life. This is who he is. The worldviews that are taught in our universities, the worldviews that are conveyed on the media, those worldviews are intended to deceive you, to, to pull you away from your walk and your relationship with Christ. They are all sourced ultimately from who, whatever the motivation of those who put those things together Ultimately, the character behind those motivations comes out. It is an effort to, to, to draw a world towards world values that pull you and I away from Christ. It is to deceive us into thinking that what they offer to us is the best thing we can have in this life. Jesus says, be careful. I will tell you the truth so that you can know you can be on guard. He tells us in 1 Peter, we're to be watchful, we're to be sober-minded, your adversary, the devil, is always prowling. He wants to destroy you. He wants to devour you. This is, this is good to be aware of this. Every believer who's walking with the Lord has a clear understanding of this reality. This is how we fight successfully. This is how we overcome successfully. By being aware of the dangers, not only out there, but aware of the impulses in my life that Satan would choose to use, desire to use to pull me away from Christ. I need to give those impulses, those sinful impulses to the Lord and say, Lord, take those from me and give me the eyes for your heart only. I have to be aware of those. I have to speak truth into my life. You need to speak truth into your life. It's a gift from the Lord this morning, His truth. The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. His goal is this. He wants to keep you he wants to keep this world from seeing the gospel. He wants to keep you from seeing the power, the transformative power of the gospel in your life. Reject that. Keep your eyes on Christ. Sin is crouching at our door every day as it was for Cain and Abel. Cain here, God says, sin is at your door and its desire is to dominate you. As an unbeliever, I am under the dominion of sin. As a believer, I have a choice. I can say no to sin and yes to to righteousness. I can say yes to the will of God. I can say yes to doing what pleases God. I can say yes to serving others. I can say no to temptation. There's a third gift that he gives us in this passage that's expressed. It's his birth to us. It's his birth. Verse, verse 2 and verse 5, and she was pregnant, this woman, and she was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth and the process of giving birth. Of course, this reflects and shows 
as Israel anticipates the Messiah, now that time has come, and Mary is now the one chosen by God to be the deliverer, to be the one who will be the mother, as it were, of Jesus. And she gave birth to a male child. That's what we see here. That child, of course, is Jesus Christ. We see here a birth. It is a miraculous birth. It is the gift of God. It is God in the flesh. God becoming man. What an amazing thing. Luke chapter 1 just shows us how amazing this is. The angel said to her, to Mary, that the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy and the Son of God. And we see, we see the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all involved in this birth, the birth of Jesus Christ. Jesus taking on humanity for the first time. Jesus taking on the form of man. Jesus becoming a man. Here, the Holy Spirit is intricately involved to protect from the, from the attack of Satan, to, to, to keep uh, the, the purity and righteousness of Jesus, keeping him pure from the sin nature that would have been passed down from Adam, but there's a miraculous birth that is, that is done here as Jesus, as the Holy Spirit uh, miraculously places Jesus into the womb of Mary. What a, what a beautiful thing here. We see God doing a divine work, God doing a work that, that protects the holiness and righteousness of God. What a beautiful thing. We see Bethlehem. Bethlehem should have never been in a picture, too small to be significant, no prophecies of Bethlehem. Then all of a sudden, here's Bethlehem, this little place. And the Word of God tells us, from you, the child of the Son of God is going to be born. That's a, that's a miracle. And the child to be born, Jesus would come, and He would save His people from their sins. He would come to save and to seek the lost. That's a miracle, folks. A Savior will be born. Everything about His birth is miraculous. There's conflict built into this narrative. We see that conflict here in Revelation chapter 12. In Matthew 2, we see Herod. Herod, after the wise men come, he realizes he's been tricked, and he sends soldiers and troops and to kill all the male children in Bethlehem in the region to try to kill Jesus. But he doesn't do it. There's a mass murder that's done here to try to eradicate the life of Jesus. Satan, even at the birth of Jesus Christ, sought to try to bring the, the issue of adultery against Mary. She could have, by the Old Testament, been a, could have been stoned to death because of adultery. And Joseph thought of that for a moment and, then, and, then was, and was led to not expose her, was led to protect her. And all of that was the work of Satan to even take Mary out before she gave birth. And yet God protected. God led Joseph. God did a miracle and was sovereign in all this. Satan was here seeking to devour the Savior at, at the moment of birth, before the birth, in the line of Jesus Christ. After he was born, G Satan is here trying to eradicate, to eliminate Jesus and his work. Jesus came for that reason. Jesus says he came, he partook of flesh and blood of the same things that we are, that through death he might destroy ultimately the work of the devil. He came to destroy the devil, his work. Jesus came, he endured the cross, he endured the shame. He did all that to destroy Satan. He did all that to bring life to you and I. What a gift. What a gift. Now we see the gift of his promise. We have seven promises here. This is number four. We see that in verse five. We see a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. This is promise, the promise of his coming reign. Here we see uh, uh, the, the fulfillment coming of prophecy that was given in Psalm chapter 2. We see that prophecy given. Here we see, here we see a picture of God, the Father, speaking with the Son, I believe. Scholars believe this is, this is the description of that exact thing right here. And God says, to the Son, you shall break them, these nations, uh, with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. You're going to break evil. You're going to break the evil of these empires, of these nations. You're going to break down these kingdoms. You're going to rule and you're going to reign, ultimately. 
Dan, uh, the book of Revelation is built upon Daniel in many ways. We've gone back to Daniel many times. Here we see in Daniel, in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream of this statue of these, ultimately it's these kingdoms, these earthly kingdoms. And ultimately Jesus comes and he destroys all of those kingdoms with his kingdom, which is eternal. In those days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to end. It shall stand forever. When Jesus came, he was, he was fulfilling, conveying a promise to you and I. His birth is a promise. His death, burial, and resurrection, a promise. Here in Revelation, a fulfillment of that promise. It is looking back, back to that birth, and now it is being fulfilled here in Revelation. We have an assurance that God is giving to us. That's another gift that he gives to us. He assures, he brings assurance into our hearts. The narrative of, of the birth of Jesus Christ is one of assurance. The whole picture of Jesus Christ coming to man is, is a picture of God's assurance to us. It says here, he will rule with a rod of iron, but her, her child was caught up to God and to his throne. You'll, and so we see that reality, we assurance. The assurance here is, is the victory. It's the victory of ascension. The assurance is, you know, because here's, here's the key. If you look here, I was, I was reading one commentary, and I liked what, what one writer said about this. One writer said, look, at, notice here, notice the comma. The comma in, in, that, in that, that verse is this. The comma is, is everything between the prophecy and the ascension of Jesus Christ. It's the, it's the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. That comma says a lot. But it wasn't the author's intent to fill the revelation with all of that content that's already been written in the scriptures. That comma, though, is, is all that took place, his birth his ministry, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And now we see Jesus Christ being caught up to glory in heaven, being with the Lord. Folks, that's victory. What that ascension communicates to Satan, what, that, what it communicates is victory. Jesus has finished his work. He's completed his work. For, you can have confidence in the work of Jesus Christ. He finished it. It's done. Timothy puts it this way in one verse. God was manifested, this mystery of God, and God was manifested. He was manifested in the flesh. He was vindicated by the Spirit. In other words, everything he did was in the power and in harmony and in righteousness with the Holy Spirit. He was seen by the angels. They saw everything he did and affirmed. He, proclaim, he was proclaimed among the nations, his gospel, his message, his ministry. He was believed on in the world, and he was taken up in, in glory. That's victory, folks. That's assurance. When you get discouraged at Christmas or in your life from day to day, remember, he's won the victory. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now is the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them night and day before our God. He's thrown down here in this passage a second time, never to have access to earth again. We'll talk about that later when we come to this chapter. Here's the reality, though. Assurance, this is final victory. It is based upon the authority of Jesus Christ. With authority, he is bringing now to completion his final kingdom. He is bringing, it's being conveyed in this passage and, and unveiled in the chapters to come, the final victory of Christ. It's coming. Galatians tells us, Jesus gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. That's what's happening here in Revelation 12. He appeared to destroy the works of the devil. That's what's taking place. Passage Chapter 12 is so close now to the second coming of Jesus Christ. The tribulation has begun. The rapture has occurred. We're halfway through the tribulation here and now Jesus is un unyielding his wrath against sin and against man. The kingdom is ultimately being Purged so the kingdom can be set up. He is doing his work here. The third, the sixth part of his gift, the sixth element of his gift is in this passage as well. It's just God's provision into our life, how he provides for us day in and day out. Verse six, we see this reality in the context here. The woman was being attacked by Satan, pursued by Satan, Israel, that is, and she fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. I believe this is a reference to the second half of the tribulation. We talk about that later when we get there. But the reality is this. 
is God's provision. He divinely protects the nation of Israel during the tribulation. So Satan cannot ultimately destroy her and wipe her out. He protects Israel. He loves Israel. He protects her. You know what? He does that same thing in your life and mine. This great promise we have from this, from this uh, Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they are with me. They come for me. You prepare a table before me in the very presence of my enemies. Here in Revelation 12, he is preparing a place for Israel, for her, this woman, in the very presence of Satan. He covers her, protects her. Satan cannot get to her and destroy her. He does that in your life and mine. Every day we walk by faith. God is there to protect us from the attacks of Satan. He's there to give us the armor of God to be strong. He is there to be your refuge and my refuge. He's there to be your peace and my peace. That's the message of Christmas. He also gives us this beautiful picture. He's going to go prepare a place. He's in heaven now preparing a place for you and I. That's, that's God's provision for you and I. That's hope. I look ahead with anticipation as a child of God. You and I look ahead to this very promise right here. As we walk daily, he just says this, you know what? Don't be dismayed. I'm with you, child of God. I'm with you. I, I am your God. I will, I promise, every day and every moment, I will strengthen you. I will give you the strength you need to be strong. I will help you. I will help you every day, every moment. I will be sufficient in your life. I will uphold you with strength. I will be there with my righteous right hand. Second Peter reminds us, God has given us everything we need for life and for God. This is an old translation, NIV 1984. I love it. It's my favorite translation of this verse. It expresses it so beautifully. God says, I've given you everything you need for life and godliness. It's through knowing Him. It's through knowing Him. God has provided for you. The greatest provision is in His Son, Jesus Christ. That same Son who was born in a manger is now on the stage here in Revelation 12 and is still providing for His people. Is still providing for you and I today as we serve Him and follow Him. Ultimately, we see His call into our life. That's what we see. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon became furious with the woman and went off and made war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. God calls us in the midst of an ongoing battle. He calls us to him. He calls us to be faithful to him. This woman God protects. Now he turns his attention to everyone who is a follower of Jesus Christ, to individuals of Israel, to individuals who are being saved through the tribulation. In fact, heaven is being filled in these seven years with the martyrs of those who have given their life to Jesus Christ. Satan is, is going after them and, and he is consuming their life. That's what he's doing. In fact, it says here in verse 11, and they, those coming out of the tribulation, they have conquered him. How? Well, by the blood of the lamb, that's the, that's the victory of Jesus at the cross. He gave his life for us. And of the word of their testimony, for they love not their own lives even unto death. They won the victory by giving their life to the very end, by being faithful to Jesus Christ to the very end, even if it meant giving their life. They said, Lord, I'm yours to the very end, no matter the consequence. And when they yielded to their life, when we yield our life to the Lord with that, with that kind of fervor and that kind of passion, and we say to the Lord, Lord, I'm yours, no matter what, we have won the ultimate victory over Satan because God will bring the ultimate reward to that one who walks in faith like that. We, have, we are overcomers and we conquer when we say no to sin and yes to righteousness no matter the cost. Because ultimately the reward will be beyond words for you and for I. It is certain victory. It is a promise. Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Even if I need to give my life, even if I lose my life for Christ, I am an overcomer in that, in that sacrifice to my Lord. God will honor that, reward that, when he raises me up and I am with him and he rewards and he honors, our faith is the key to that victory. And so what do we do? We thank the Lord. We thank the Lord for the privilege of standing for Christ. We thank the Lord for adversity that gives us the opportunity to display Christ. We thank the Lord for the privilege of just living for him in our life. 
our victory is through Jesus Christ. It's not, it's not our own strength. It's not our own willpower. It's simply yielding to him that he might do his work in us. He calls us ultimately in Romans 12 to this. He says to you and I, simply do this. Simply present yourself to the Lord. Lord, I'm yours today. Lord, I'm yours. I give, I give myself to you. Lord, I want, I want you to have all of me today. I want you to use me today. Whatever your plan is today for my life, whatever your plan is for me, I want to do that today. Lord, I give myself to you. Take my mind and transform it. I don't want to be conformed to this world. I don't want to be conformed to, to impulses in my flesh to pull me away from you. God, give me eyes for you only, for your word, for the relationship I have in you. God, give me the, the, the passion, the desire, the will to love you most of all. God, I'm yours. Do that in my life. Lord, do that in my life. I want that more than anything else. That's the response to, to, to these gifts that are conveyed to us, given to us at Christmas. God has given to us his very life. And he's brought to us all these wonderful truths. He's given to us the ability to appreciate, to understand, to put into action, to enable the strength of the Word of God, of our relationship in Christ, so that we can be overcomers and bring honor and glory to Him. He calls us to be set apart. We're to be set apart. We're to make room in our hearts so God can write His story into our life. That's ultimately, as we think about Christmas and the narrative of Christmas this morning, the context is conflict, spiritual warfare. Jesus went to the cross. He died. That's warfare. He rose from the dead and he won the victory. He is in heaven now. He's coming back. In Revelation, we see him fulfilling everything that has ever been prophesied. He is bringing to completion the victory. He is, he is offering the reward to those who have been faithful, the reward of his presence, the reward of eternal favor and blessing from God. He says simply to you and I, give me your life. And so here at Christmas, it's a great opportunity to say, Lord, the greatest gift I've ever received was relationship with you. In return, I give my life to you that you might use it. Lord, by your, your strength and your spirit, work in me so that I can let go of those things that hinder me from being yours. Keep changing me, conforming me to you. God, make me into your image. Give me the strength, the ability, the power to be yours, to honor you, to make choices that are life-changing, to invest in others the power of the gospel and to be a difference maker for you. If you need Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning, that's the first place, first place to start. The greatest gift is eternal life. That you would confess your, your need before the Lord, your sin to Him, and ask Him to, to forgive you, to wash you clean, to step into your life as your Lord and Savior, and to say, Lord, I'm yours for the remainder of my life to serve you, to love you, to honor you. Because I believe you that one day it'll be worth it all. May the Lord bless you here at Christmas. May he honor your faithfulness to him. May he call you to faithfulness in him, I pray in Jesus' name. That's what we pray. Lord, enable this in our lives by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining with us today. Merry Christmas.